I wanted to start out asking, I was reading various things, blogs, books that you've read, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And um, My herbs. Yeah. <laughs> if you will. Yes. <laughs> and one thing that struck me was that you had a very interesting pre-writing career. Yes. Or careers. Yes. Or journey. Yes. What? Well, see, I just got fired a lot, so, um, and it's good that I can write for a living because um, I, I don't really have any other marketable skills, and otherwise my, my family would starve, so, uh, so it's good. Yeah, I, um, I was a teacher. Um, I was trained as a teacher at Portland State University, and I taught in Oregon, and I also taught in Minneapolis. Um, I became a teacher at kind of the worst time to be a teacher in, in the state of Minnesota. Um, I was when just there was just massive layoffs, so it was blood in the water. And um, and that's actually the reason why I became a freelance writer, um, it's because I just needed to make some money. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, But prior to that, I worked as a park ranger um, in Olympic National Park, and that was pretty cool. I was trained as a wildland firefighter, and I um, uh, was also trained in search and rescue. Um, so I did both of those, and um, and prior to that, I I mean I worked as a uh, bartender for a while. I worked in a carpentry shop for a while. Um, I was a waitress for a while. I worked in a coffee shop. I made amazing lattes, um, and um, I um, I worked in a at a golf course doing dumb stuff there. Uh, I was a oh I I delivered uh, phone books in Florida in August. That was. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, uh, uh, what else did I do? I was janitor for a while. I worked in a. Um, I was a church musician. Uh, when I lived in Spain, I sang Irish songs at an Irish bar to drunk Americans. I made money that way. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to like figure out how to like you know make sure you don't go broke. So you can do lots of different things. Yeah. But um, uh, but the sum of these experiences, like I'm, I just I'm not really prepared for very very many things. But um, <laughs> but I'm a very curious person yeah um so that has served me well and that so that was part of my question with all that crazy experience mm-hmm. that grand tour of um being employed mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and fired yeah yes does that has that helped your writing career or is it something that you try to forget until some guy asks you about? i think it does help and that um i mean <sighs> I mean, one of the things that you learn along the way um, is that nobody knows what they're doing. Right. You know, and nobody knows what they're doing. Yeah. And I know, I, and because of my career is what it is right now, I've met all kinds of, you know, writers that we have seen in the library and seen in Barnes & Noble and whatever, and they don't know what they're doing either. Nobody right. knows what they're doing. Yeah. And, um, and and the nice thing about my, my path is that I've been in a lot of different realms, and I've learned that nobody knows what they're doing. Yeah. Anywhere. Right. At any time. Okay. And that's helpful, actually. Yeah. And so what that means is that as a writer, we kind of have to make things up as we go along. We uh-huh. have to, um, uh, if, if we don't do it, the scene doesn't happen. If we don't do it, the world doesn't get made. Yeah. Um, if we don't do it, the characters don't exist. Like, if we don't do it, the book doesn't exist. Right. It just doesn't exist in the world. Sure. And so, so in some ways, it is helpful that I don't know what I'm doing, and that's okay. Yeah. Because nobody does. Yeah. And also... I can, I have done, I've had, been in enough situations where I have to make things up as I go along, that I know how to make things up as I go along. Which I hear is, has something to do with writing. It does, actually. Yeah. 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 So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. So, let's talk a little bit then about how how your career started. You started in short fiction, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And also, so I, I mean, really what I started as uh, as a poet. Um, okay. I, my very first publication was poetry, but it was under my maiden name, Kelly Regan. Okay. Um, and I think those those magazines don't even exist anymore. I mean, this really? was a long yeah. time ago. Sure. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, I was a creative writing major and a theology major in college. And, um, and then, and you know, at the time, I wrote all the time. And I just felt like I would never stop. Mm-hmm. And then I graduated and I stopped. Mm. Um, I just didn't have anything to say yeah. anymore. And um, and it really wasn't until my children were born that I started writing again. Uh, so my twenties were this time of like really not writing. Yeah. Um, but um, after. Um, 
uh, after my second child was born, I was laid off. I had to figure out what was going, what what I was doing, and I kind of had this experience where I wanted to return to writing. I knew that I wanted to do that, and I started. And but who I was as a writer was very different than who I used to be. Sure. And I I started writing these very sort of um, uh, surrealistic um, uh, short stories, and I didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't. I I. I I didn't really, I had never read, um, I didn't know that there were uh, fantasy and science fiction magazines that right. published stories. Okay. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, and um, and so, but those were the places that were buying my my stuff, you know. Yeah. I was sort of like doing what everybody does, like oh, what a writer's market, you know. Oh, I could send stuff here. Yeah. And those were the people that bought my stuff. I was like, well, I guess this is the kind of writer I am. Yeah. And at the same time, um, I, I, I mean, I just really needed to, um, because diapers are expensive, you know. <laughs> And right. um, and so I um, I had written a letter to Capstone Press, which is a um, uh, it's a school. At the time, they were doing primarily uh, schools and libraries um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, types of books, and I had used a lot of their materials as okay. a, as a teacher, and you know, and also as a teacher, you know, again, you make it up as you go along. Right. I had written a lot of curriculum. Like I hadn't realized how my, how much curriculum I had writ- written until the end of the year. I decided to pull, print it all out and make a portfolio and 500 pieces of paper came out. Oh, wow. So I was like, well, no wonder I was so stressed out. <laughs> um, I was working pretty hard this yeah. year. And so I was able to, so I, so I put some stuff together and, you know, and I sent them a letter saying, listen, I've used your stuff a lot and, you know, here's what I can do as a writer. If you want to hire me, I'd love to do stuff. And they yeah. hired me. They, um, oh, I, I wrote two books for them um, that, you know, the project didn't, ended up getting canned, but they still Still paid me, and then and then I ended up writing, um, uh, publishing thirteen books with them, um, and I was doing that at the same time that I was writing these, you know, increasingly strange um, uh, short stories, and I didn't realize at the time that that experience was really building me into a um, uh, a children's author. Yeah. Um, uh, when you write um, high interest nonfiction books for children, yeah. um, like I would write books that had titles like Sewers and the Rats Who Love Them. Uh, <laughs> Um, and things like that and um, I mean they had to be really well researched and so I had to learn a lot of things which is good because I'm a curious person yeah um, and but then also you have to write these in such a way where you have all these limitations on you mm-hmm. you know and so you have to be very careful in how you build a sentence and how you build yeah. a, um, a paragraph because your sentences can't be um, past a certain number of words and not only that they have to be an average of a certain number of words okay. Okay. And your paragraphs can't go past a certain number yeah. of words, and um, and you have limitations uh, for what wor- what your word choice can be, um, and so it was kind of like nonfiction haiku with jokes, <laughs> okay. um, yeah. and um, and so I learned a lot um, in terms of how to craft. Yeah. Um, uh, and how to write for clarity, and also how to write for engagement. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then I accidentally wrote a novel. So. Right. And then it was for children. So yeah. There you go. So I was like, I guess I'm this writer. So that highly structured, prescriptive sort mm-hmm. of formula you had to follow. Did that? How did that help with with the fiction? Uh, Just- yeah, I mean, primarily, um, I, in terms of you know just writing for clarity. Yeah. Um, I, I, and but also, um, I, I, being able to write a sentence that can stand on its own feet. Okay. Um, and um, and uh, because uh, you know a sentence is a tool, and um, and and I think it really is important to ask ourselves, you know, how you know what is the muscle and so what is the engine in the sentence, mm-hmm. and and what are the different directions that it's going right? yeah and because um, a sentence always has to do more than one thing yeah and um, and so when you can really really focus on um, uh, you know how like w- what your sentence looks like on the page how it sounds in the ear because yeah. kids when they read they're still sounding in right. their head yeah. um, and so how your sentences sound is really important yeah um, and so um, yeah I forgot what your question is <laughs> <laughs> 
about structure. Yeah. Oh yeah, building me into a, a children's author. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, I, you know, I mean, Madeline Langle said, you know, you can work very hard and learn how to write, and maybe you'll write a book. And then if you work even harder, eventually you can write a book for children. Right. Um, and uh, um, and that's the thing. Like writing for children is really hard. Yeah. It's really really hard. Like you have to be so careful. And those books are edited within an inch of their life. I know people yeah. who write for adults who like they get a cursory edit. You know, I mean, we go deep in right. um, to everything and like all of these like every single one of my questions has like 97 questions, you know, yeah. like yeah. okay, well what about this? What about this? You know, this needs to be seated by the way. Um, uh, and uh, um, you know, we people often will complain about how like we don't have who was that famous editor that, you know, edited Hemingway and um, uh, Fitzgerald and everybody, you know who I'm talking about. It's the same guy. Dr. Famous Editor. Yeah, Dr. Famous Editor. And people yeah. say, we don't have that guy anymore. But right. we do. And they're all in children's They're all in children's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, one of the things that that fascinates me with uh, your your books is, is the world building. Yeah. Uh, I like the way that... I'll give you my experience. Okay, good. And then you can react. Okay, good. So when I start one, it feels magical, Mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing. Yeah, good. Right? That is the goal. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. But I initially start out with a thought about kind of what the world is like, right? Mm -hmm. And then that begins to change. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is intentional on your part, but the world unfolds as Mm -hmm. I read. Yeah. Right? Rather than okay, this is a, a Tolkien-y world, yeah. right, or whatever. Um, I just, I, I find that very fascinating. It, it seems to add to the journey as a reader. Mm-hmm. Is that something you're doing intentionally? Yeah, or? for sure. Okay. For sure. Okay, so back up. Um, uh, uh, so first of all, um, uh, when we're talking about sort of books generally, you know, when we talk about middle grade versus young adult versus adult yeah. adult, adult books, yeah. the quick and dirty way of understanding it is that um, uh, is in terms of view, right? Um, the view of the middle grade book is entirely outward, right? Because right. kids are trying to understand the world that they're in, sure. and they don't know all the things, yeah. and so they're extrapolating constantly, yeah. and they are they're guessing that if this is true, then that means all these other things must be true. I think, yeah. but then those are changing over time, right? And okay. so they are they are trying to they are trying to um, write the world, and they're trying to understand their 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 place in it. Which is why when you talk to an eleven year old and you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, they'll give you eleven million things, right? <laughs> right. Um, um, and um, for the young adult novel, the view is inward, okay. right? It is who am I and what does that mean? Yeah. And 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 it's about those choices that you can you can't undo, yeah. right? I have never been a person who has done X, and now I have done X, and now I'm that person forever. And what does that right. mean? And what how does that impact the me that is me that I think is there but maybe isn't? I right. don't know. Okay. Right. And that's sure. why when you talk to a teenager and ask a teenager what they want to be when they grow up. Yeah. They say, why are you making aggressive eye contact with me and can I please go to my room? <laughs> and I say that with all the love in my heart because I have three teenagers. And yeah. I love them all very much, but that is soon right. how they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with adult books, um, uh, the view is backward. How did I get here? <laughs> and what does that mean? Right? Um, and All my life is behind me. Right. Yes. Right? Okay. So with a middle grade book, and this is how the and this is how world building um, does need to happen, I think, for the okay. middle, middle grade book, um, is that the the world unfolds. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because um, uh, because a kid does not understand all the all the moving parts of the world that they're in. But um, but every day they learn a little bit more. Yeah. Right? And every day the world is revealed to them yeah. a little bit more. Right. Um, and so when you're when you're writing a middle grade fantasy, um, uh, that way in which like things will unfold and 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 that they, they they are able to open up these different little interlocking parts, and then they realize, oh, all of these things are actually related, yeah. and this thing that I thought was true is actually not true at all, yeah. right? And 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 that is very and and mostly because that that ties into the experience of what it means to be eleven. Yeah, you know, um, uh, my parents don't always tell me all the truth. Right. right? 
right. they don't. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, I, they are telling me that like everything is fine when actually like they might lose the house, but they're not going to tell me that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have to figure out, but I'm gonna, but I'm gonna assume all kinds of things, right? Yeah. You know, um, uh, a woman that I know who's a child psychiatrist, she says, you know, children are incredible noticers, and they are awful analyzers. <laughs> Okay. And of course, they can't be good analyzers because they don't have a life experience. You right. know, they don't have the context. Yeah. But they notice everything, and that can be super problematic for them yeah. because they will notice a detail, and um, and they won't know what it means, and they don't have the context to understand it, and so they will create a context that doesn't exist, right? Yeah. And um, and then that's why that's why therapists are jo- are, are, are employed <laughs> now, um, and um, uh, because those those things can actually cause wounds on their psyches you know? right so anyway so that's that is what I try to do is to sort of you yeah. know mimic that experience um, and also I think it can be helpful for kids too to um, uh, because it, it feels very safe to be in a, in a fantasy world yeah. you know and to um, uh, and to sort of like have this empathetic experience of like walking through this path with another yeah. character in a, in a context that's totally different from that from from their own from their own world right. and yet to, to like um, uh, to see somebody trying to understand the world and and to make sense of things yeah. um, I think is very powerful for them. yeah yeah, no, I, I love that aspect of it, and I it it made a, your description makes a great deal of sense. I I'm getting ready to um, this summer we're we're taking the kids to uh, Europe, and we've been it's fascinating trying to explain. Okay, we're gonna go here, and we're gonna go there, and then but but the whole idea of of scale and mm-hmm. and how these places connect, and you know all that sort of thing. And then, and so I was kind of struggling with this. And then last night I went to, I brought them with me to drop some things off here. And uh, I realized that they got totally lost on just between going here and yeah. the place we stopped on the way. It is fascinating, yeah. right? This mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. way in which they experience the world. Yeah, it's very different from ours. And we have, and, and we do have to, I think it is important, it's important as parents, but for sure as, as somebody who, who writes for, for these kids, I, I, take my, I take my role in, you know, their um, imaginative life very seriously. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel very grateful to be able to do it. You yeah. know? Um, uh, because I do think that books do play a role in yeah. um, how they navigate and how and just what tools are available to them yeah. you know as like things are difficult or whatever yeah you just reminded me that part of why they got lost was because they were imagining that we were being attacked by robots well so, and, right? like, like so that'll do it yeah, yeah, yeah. right mm-hmm, mm-hmm, for sure um, <laughs> so you uh, you've you've written some amazing books you've mm-hmm. written this one which mm-hmm. is my as we just dis- as you and I just discussed my my oldest daughter's favorite uh, book. You, this won the Newbery Medal. And yeah. For those of us who are aspiring children's fantasy writers, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. um, how did how'd you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's the thing. So there are some people who they they know somehow that like their books are part of this discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, when I turned that book in, I I sent it into my my um, uh, my editor with a letter of apology. Okay, uh, it's true. I was like, nobody's gonna like this book. It's too weird. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, and and you know the um, people are gonna think it's too girly and like and like that's that's just it. I swear I'll I'll do better next. Time. <laughs> okay. That's what I told her. Yeah. Um, and she's like, mm-hmm, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, and you know, my my publisher, it is nice being with a small publisher. They are very kind to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will never leave Algonquin. They, I, I feel like I'm a tiny bird in a nest, being well cared <laughs> for all the time, which is what I need. Yeah. And um, and so. Uh, I do think generally they are aware of things that I'm not aware of, um, and sort of I'm like, oh, she doesn't need to know that. They're like parents, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and um, and so there are there 
there certainly are writers that, that they, they know that their books are being discussed in this way. And right. they know that their books are in the mix. Yeah. And there are even writers who wake up early on that fateful Monday morning yeah. um, because they might get a phone call. Yeah. I had no idea. Because your name isn't Neil Gaiman. Right, or whatever, yeah. you know. Um, uh, I had no idea. Um, and uh, um, it just, it didn't even occur to me that that right. was even a possibility. I mean, first of all, it doesn't go to high fantasy novels. Yes, yeah, yeah. Like, so why would I even think that? Right. And um, and so um, the thing is, and, and actually... Um, uh, I um, I have a cousin who um, uh, uh, is stage four of cancer and um, and she's actually doing fine right now. Um, uh, uh, she's so because the universe is cruel and capricious and unfair. She's also one of the world's experts in cancer research. Oh, wow. um, uh, the uh, drug that she developed for uh, breast cancer is saving women right now. Wow. Uh, she's amazing and um, and despite everything is still like presenting research in Switzerland and whatever. Uh, but at the time. Uh, she was actually quite ill and we were very very worried she was in the hospital yeah. and so which is the reason why my phone was next to my bed usually mm-hmm. I, my phone is in the kitchen right um, and um, and so when when the phone rang and it was a number I didn't know my heart sank and I feared the worst and I said sure. hello and on the other end was a room full of really enthusiastic and cheerful librarians <laughs> uh, who changed my life um, and and, um, and it's a strange thing, you know. Um, on one hand, um, I, I mean, because my book has that sticker on it, um, it's going to yeah. outlive me. That's a strange experience. That's yeah. a strange feeling. It's it's now uh, translated in 38 languages. That's a really crazy experience. Yeah. Um, and um, and what it really means is um, I, I, the the kids that I am interacting with are there's just more of them mm-hmm. now. Yeah. And that's a crazy experience. Uh, but in the end, like you're still yourself, right? right. You know, yeah. the the imposter syndrome that's still there. It's right. just in like a way different context um uh the self-doubt the like you know the sort of like you know crushing inactivity all of that's the same stuff yeah you know so um (laughs) like it doesn't change anything it just means that my emails are now basically like a federal disaster area there's (laughs) there's fema tents in my gmail account so right okay so yeah tell me about um magic so Mm -hmm. Your magic is within across your works is so interesting. Mm. It's uh, different types. They're interacting in different ways. There's um, there's a lot of different com- components to it. Uh, local author Brandon Sanderson. Oh, yeah. He has his his um, rules of magic. Yeah. Right. It's uh, you can sort of lay out the rules and. And there you go. You've created this this magic machine where you basically know exactly how it's going to operate. And then you have George R. R. Martin who says magic is the unknowable or something along mm-hmm. those lines, right? Um, and then I often hear magic in um, children's literature just sort of written off as well as long as it creates a sense of wonder, you're good, mm-hmm. right? Where, where, what is magic to you? You know. So, it mean, it depends on the piece, mm-hmm. right? Because um, it's very specific to yeah. the world. Uh, and it's very specific to, you know, what's happening in this story. Like, on one hand, um, I... we have to ask ourselves like what rules is it useful for the reader to know Mm -hmm. right I mean we all I mean we we live in this universe that like there's all we interact with all and interface with all kinds of things that like I mean how the hell does that thing work I don't know you know, right. I'm sure there's rules, but yeah. uh, but I don't need to know them, and 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 to and and to even like get into any kind of discussion of it would not be useful to the story that we're that we're telling right now. Right. right? Sure. And so, um, so in some ways, like in middle grade, it isn't so much that like it's that sense of wonder or whatever, um, uh, but um, uh, but it is um, it is simply a part of the world that mm. operates in a way that like they can kind of get. Um, right. uh, 
but um, but they don't always understand it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, um, you know, my first book, um, uh, uh, mostly true story of Jack, um, uh, magic was was profoundly tied to the magical world, uh, to the natural world, and in fact, it was profoundly tied to trees and seeds, actually, yeah. and how they operate. Yeah. Um, and um, and so I learned a lot about um, uh, uh, the grafting of fruit trees. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, and and that played a role into like what this magic was and how it worked. Yeah. Um, and and also um, uh, you know how seeds germinate. Yeah. And um, and that played a role into you know how the magic operated and how it worked. Um, uh, in Ironhearted Violet, there wasn't really a lot of magic. Um, there was like whatever wicked gods and stuff. And right. um, that actually that book started. Um, because you know, my um, uh, I had gotten into this program that um, at the time was funded by NASA. Now somebody else funds it, um, uh, uh, called Launchpad, which, by the way, highly recommend it. Um, if you're interested in science fiction at all, Launchpad is a, a um, uh, uh, it's a science um, science fiction um, science workshop, okay. um, and it's taught out at um, uh, the University of Wyoming um, mm -hmm. in the astronomy department there, oh, wow. um, uh, and you. See spend a week learning about um, astronomy, cosmology, and physics, and playing with wow. la lasers and giant uh, telescopes. It was basically Nerdvana. It was awesome. Sounds great. Yeah, it was really awesome. So yeah, they they um, uh, you know they, they fly you out, they feed you, the accommodations are very Spartan, you're in mm -hmm. the dorms, and yeah. boy, those are bleak dorms. <laughs> but whatever, it's fine. Um, and you just learn a lot. So yeah. the year that I was there, our teacher was, um, he was the science ed uh, the science advisor for Battlestar Galactica um, oh, wow. and okay. also a NASA scientist and was uh, the uh, head scientist for the Cassini projects and, uh, or the Cassini probe I mean yeah. and um, and he gave this um, uh, uh, this lecture on theory of multiple universes and and sort of the math behind it and mm -hmm. that was so uh, entrancing to me yeah. so I just made a pocket universe and put a dragon in it because I'm still me <laughs> you know right. yeah. like you would of course. Um, and um, with the Witch's Boy, um, I was interested in, um, uh, you know, uh, magic that is intelligent, uh -huh. um, uh, and um, and and magic that um, uh, that sort of that is tied to that part of the self that um, doesn't always listen to us, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and um, and also magic that you know has really very clear consequences, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and so that that is taxing and. Um, um, uh, and and that became this you know um, uh, this way of thinking about all kinds of things. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, and with um, with girl who drank the moon, um, uh, I mean there is there's the magic that that is a, that is imbued inside of Luna. But then there's also kind of the practical magics that are sort of you know found and manipulated, right? And and you see that a little bit in yeah. um, the character of the Mad Woman. Um, I get into it more. They had me write a prequel story. Um, uh. Um, uh, the, uh, of Zan when she was a child. Okay. Um, and um, and and the 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 destroyed castle that's in the book is still there, and all the magicians uh -huh. are there, and Zazimos, who she talks about, you know, yeah. is still there, and Virian's mother is there, okay. and and, yeah. um, uh, and and so you see a little bit more of those who study magic as opposed to those who are magic, and that's sort of right. Anyway. So, and within these stories, the the nature of the magic interacts a lot with obviously how your characters are developing do you kind of do you start out thinking i want a character to go through a certain sort of experience that involves magic or do you start with magic or does it depend it really depends yeah. i mean most of my books start with a box um, and um, where I'll just throw things in there. It's like a place. It's like a physical placeholder. Okay. So I have to think about a book for a long time sure. before I can yeah. write it. And um, and the one exception to that is Witch's Boy, actually, um, where um, I started that bo that book. It was a story I was telling out loud to my son, 
Um, uh, my son um, was kind of a handful of his child um, <laughs> and, um, and kind of took a lot out of me. And, uh, you know, the, um, our life was a series of no, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, when he was nine months old, he climbed to the top of the refrigerator. When he was a year, he learned how to use the stove. Um, and when he was two, he climbed to the roof. Oh, wow. Of the, uh, yeah. So um, he was, uh, the, the fact that he's still alive is a testament to my iron will and <laughs> um, all of my gray hairs. So, um, but, you know, the, um, the, the, the most positive time that he and I had was at night when I would cuddle up with him and he would ask me to tell him a story from my imagination. Hmm. And I would tell him that he would have to come up with three things. Yeah. And, um, and usually it was about two little boys named Leo. One was a boy and one was like a robot or a skeleton or an alien or something. Um, and they would have various adventures and would fight crime. Yeah. Um, and, but one day, um, we were in Shenandoah National Park hiking. Okay. And we were staying on the Skyline Drive, which is a beautiful place to stay. There's beautiful little cabins you can stay in there. And, um, and we went on, on a hike uh, from the trailhead. And, and because you're on the Skyline, you know, you're on the ridge. And so all of your tra trails go down. Right. And we were um, hiking. So we hiked two and a half miles to um, this beautiful, beautiful Bridal Fall, Bridal Vale Falls. And, um, and he ran the whole way. And then we had to do two and a half miles back up. And it was very hard. And it was very big rocks. And he wanted me to carry him, which I was not going to do. And then he really wanted to grow wings. And he wanted teleportation to exist. And, um, and, uh, and I was like, OK, buddy, let's just tell a story to just make it through. And, and so I was like, OK, give me three things. And he says, I want you to tell a story about a boy who steals his mother's magic. And I was like, in. <laughs> um, and, and I was like, why does he steal his mother's magic? Uh, to protect it from bandits. I was like, super in. Um, and, um, and I was like, okay, then we need one more thing. And he's like, okay, his best friend is a wolf. I was like, great. So it's, anyway, that's how that story began. Yeah. And I had no idea wow. what was going on, where it was going to go, and like yeah. where it, at all. I just followed the rest. I spent the rest of the summer writing that book. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Leo. That was ha yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> More than a little handy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so on that topic, then let's talk about being being a mother, being a parent. Yeah. And writing. Yeah, it's hard. Well, tell me how to do it. Yeah, it's hard. Failing it's, again. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, here's the thing. Um, what I used to do, um, so I used to do two different things. First of all, I would wake up at four in the morning and write until six. Um, and then um, wake up my kid and get ready for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And um, and um, it was an important thing for me to do. I can't recommend it. Um, uh, I basically went nuts. And um, I didn't write anything particularly good. Yeah. Uh, during that time sure um, but I did learn how to write a novel I did write a novel that nobody will see like right. and I and I learned how to do it and that was good um, and uh, um, and then what I would do is I would sort of leave my computer open um, and like try to steal some little bits of time but that wasn't really useful either mm -hmm. because because then I was really never fully present in any particular world sure. and that wasn't good either yeah um, uh, at some point um, I mean so there, there were some things that worked really well for me. Um, uh, first of all, um, uh, kid swaps was really um, very useful, um, uh, and I, you know, would have. So there were two other moms on my block, and we would just like all take the children to mm -hmm. so them, and they, and they also were doing creative en endeavors, and so that was really oh, helpful. That's great. Yeah, um, and um, but I live in Minnesota, and Minnesota has really great support for the arts, um, uh, which means that we have grants that are. Oh artists can get that um, are um, uh, uh, that are without strings attached oh, that's and nice. that was huge for yeah. me actually because what that meant um, was that I could um, uh, I could say okay that gives me you know two months of childcare at four hours a day yeah. um, and I can actually get something and, the, and what's amazing and what you will learn um, is that you're way more efficient than you realize um, you're actually insanely efficient 
Um, and you don't realize it until your kids are in school. Um, and, uh, and, um, and you don't realize it until you actually have time. And you're just like, whoa, you know, you can just like get so much done. Yeah. That was, that was really an amazing thing for me to realize. Um, uh, once everybody's in school, like that, that's where things get, get easier. I mean, it's easier and harder. Like, um, I, yeah. uh, I mean, you still have whatever, you still have to take them to the dentist and whatever. So all that, all that stuff right there, or like somebody peed and you have to go pick them up or somebody barfed and you have to go pick them up or somebody's got a fever and you got to go pick them up. And because they basically spend all day in a Petri dish, you right. know? Yeah. Um, um, uh, and schools are disgusting. Yeah. Um, and so they're constantly getting sick. And so there's that, you yeah. know. Um, and and also like you've got you know sports games and band concerts and um, uh, you know sort of infinity things that you have to do after school. But there still are you get enough days where you've got like a consistent amount of time during the day. And that's really huge, you know. I mean, Virginia Woolf was right, you know, like you do need a space to create. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, it's really hard not to, you know. Um, uh, It also helped, I mean, my husband is incredibly supportive um, and has been really from the get go. And, um, uh, um, uh, you know, we 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 didn't have two nickels to rub rub together, but he like went on eBay and like bought me like a used laptop, it was this old it was a, a million degrees and it did end up actually bursting into flames on my lap that was awesome um, so um, it was very exciting um, but you were a firefighter so. I, so I knew what to do yeah it's really true there yeah you go. yeah I knew exactly what to do um, and um, I did not back up the novel though so that was that was uh, it, it's 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 okay because it's how I came up with my my theory of revision which is select all delete um, um, uh, and just recreate from memory, oh, which is really? like, oh. oh yeah, that's how I do it. So huh. yeah, I can't recommend that either, but it's for, it works for me. That's so intense. I know. Yeah, you know, I just <laughs> can't stand the heat. <laughs> so great. Yeah, Alicia, do I get to take questions from the audience? You can if you like. Okay. Okay. Good. Are there questions from the audience? You know, you have a sign out there that says you're full and go look for another event. What? I We're just, very full. Yeah, I know. I just think a lot of people must have been turned around. Here. Oh, interesting. Well, I don't know why that yeah. sign would be there. Well, it's uh, fine. It's probably not big as well. Yeah. Yeah. So expand on that a little more, what you just said. So you write a first draft and then you yeah. use it? Or you... uh, well, so um, uh, eventually I had to stop erasing entirely because I was giving my husband an, an ulcer and he does work so hard for me. So um, uh, uh, so now I have a, um, uh, a, a, a... So first of all, my first draft is longhand. Um, and um, longhand is very quiet. Computers are loud. Um, uh, so and also um, this really interesting brain research on uh, why longhand is really great for us. Um, uh, we have to bring our we're, we're taking an object and we're going back and forth across the midline of the brain. Um, uh, uh, this is something that they do actually now with uh, veterans with PTSD. It's a um, it's a type of uh, therapy called EMDR, uh, where things go back and forth across the midline of the brain, trying to get both sides of the brain to fire. Uh, it's very useful for artists. Um, uh, uh, because it causes it, it causes our you know um, our more logical brain to interact with our um, uh, our brain that the part of our brain that works in metaphor, um, and I, I find that I'm a better writer in longhand. Um, so I write um, I write in longhand, um, then I read through it. Um, I'll take a couple of notes, and then I put it away and I recreate from memory um, uh, on um, uh, I. In my uh, on my computer, so my longhand draft is draft zero. My draft one is um, is the is the first one, um, and so I used to erase draft one. I don't do that anymore. So now I have a file that's called worthless crap, um, and um, and then I recreate again. Um, uh, so it's it's a very intensive process. That's why I don't. That's why I don't write a book a year, um, and. Um, but the nice thing about that, I mean, one of the things that I learned when I had the computer burst into flames uh, is that when I had to, I mean, I cried and cried because it was, you know, 200 pages that were gone. 
and um, uh, but after that, I um, I realized that I know these characters. I know the place. I know what it smells like. I know what the textures are like. I know how to be in each particular moment, and um, and I and um, and it allowed me to. And I know what happens. So it allowed me to be in these places in a place that was much more present than I would have been before um, I, um, when I was just trying to figure it out, you know? So, anyway. Good question. Really good question. I've been thinking about deleting a book just for this purpose. Yeah, so. yeah. You can just put it in another file called Alicia's Northwest trying Track. to encourage yeah. me to do it. Mm -hmm. Delete it sooner, Luke. You volunteered to delete your book. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Alicia, you have questions you're dying to ask. No, I was thinking. Someone else. Yes. Right here. Um, when I was reading this book, The Girl Who Drinks the Moon, I felt like you were so sensitive to trauma mm -hmm. and the survivors of trauma and mm -hmm. to the concepts of loss and yeah. love, and you did it so beautifully. Thank you. And I. Thank you, I guess. Thank you very Sorry, much. Question. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Trauma's really interesting. Um, uh, I'm reading a book on trauma right now called The Body Keeps a Score. I am too. Oh, yeah, see? Great book. These people are reading it now. It's so <laughs> useful. I'm so pleased to be reading it. But it was also interesting um, uh, how... Um, just how the brain interacts with trauma and how the body interacts with trauma and how how those little threads will unwind um, as we move through. And I mean, I think we've all seen that in our families. We've seen that in our workplaces. We see it all the time. Um, and um, and um, thank you. Um, uh, and 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 children experience it too, you know. So um, uh, there's another reason I think why it's just important to write these books to you know give kids some tools. So, anyway, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, please. Study trauma at all in order to? No, not really. I mean, um, I mean, certainly, like we all have our own histories uh, of that, and um, and I'm no different. Um, and um, but um, but I also am in a family that um, has been touched by mental illness in different ways, um, and so um, so that for sure feeds into uh, the story. Uh, but and also I have a. Um, a, a uh, my sister is a uh, child psychiatrist, and she's a child, she's a researcher. Um, and so I, uh, it isn't so much that like I would use her as research, but I but just in our conversations, I learn so much um, uh, about sort of how the brain interacts, but also how the brain heals. Um, it's fascinating to me. So um, so yeah. Um, uh, that uh, I was not so much like in depth research as it was sort of like um, a lifetime of noticing things and listening to those conversations. Uh, what was your question, Alicia? Oh, um, one of the things that I really like about The Girl Who Drank the Moon is the narrative voice. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you developed that and? kept it consistent and kind of the, the feeling that you were going for? Yeah. So all of my books, as I said, start with a box. And um, and I really, it's hard for me to start until I have a sense of what I want the texture of the language to be. And it's hard for me to even explain what that means. It's just that I know it when I hear it in my head. Um, and here's the thing about me. I'm not a visual thinker at all. I'm an almost entirely an aural thinker. Um, I, I, um, I think all almost entirely in sound and also sort of like sensory. Um, and um, so I remember when I was a kid, like realizing that people had pictures in their heads and they could like see something in their head that was bizarre to me. Um, and, um, and I was like, wait, so you think of a beach and you see a beach? They're like, yeah. And uh, what, you, what happens with you? I was like, I don't feel a beach. You know, and like my children, and it isn't that I can't have visual images in my head. I can. It's just is work for me. Uh, so my three kids, I love them so much. I can't even stand how much I love them. Um, but if I want to get their pictures in my head, I, it's really hard um, uh, for me to try to 
picture them, but I have their voices in my head all the time. Um, and so, um, so how a book sounds is really important to me. And I can't start until I have a sense of what that voice feels like in the body, of what it feels like in the mouth to say, what it feels like in the ear to hear, how it resonates. Um, and um, and so, and then, and then, like I have an idea, but of course, you know, as Hemingway tells us, first drafts are always crap. Um, uh, so, like your first draft is like you can can see it like it's like Moses and the mountain. I the mountain is over there, but I how I think I'll get there. Um, and um, so the revision is where is where that really gets rarefied. And all of my revision is out loud. Um, and um, I, I will read a section over and over and over again until it, I can feel like it lays right in the ear. Um, and um, I perform it to my dog, Sirius Black. He's a great listener. Um, and and uh, he's nothing like his namesake. He would not last five seconds in Azkaban. It's very <laughs> needy. Um, uh, but, um, but he sits there by a little lap door. Um, and um, and until until it feels right, and then and then I record myself, and then I have the manuscript open, and then I will um, uh, I, I take notes and mark things where it, it gets off. And I mean, I tell my students to do this all the time. You know, your ear. I mean, your eye forgives all kinds of stuff. Your eye is super forgiving, but your ear is a bastard, um, and uh, it doesn't let you get away with anything. Um, and so you can hear when the narrator gets off way way sooner than it, you would ever see be able to see if you were just you know, reading silently so anyway that's where that comes from lots and lots of reading out loud so great in the audiobook for the girl who drinks the moon how well do you think she captured I have no idea because I haven't heard it all of my books are audiobooks and I have not listened to any of them um, and primarily because it's too stressful for me um, and it's it's like it's dissonant for me um, and again because I've just have lived with with the text out loud for so long um, so I have actually no no idea I know that she was up for an award so I think she did fine um, but um, uh, but I have no idea. And this is the thing, like the um, uh, so box animation is a, has optioned the movie or the book for a movie. And I don't know if it will actually get made. Probably not, because Hollywood is a place where where things don't get made. And like the uh, the except the rule is that they don't get made, and the exception is that they get made, right? And so, but like whatever the you know the um, uh, I. Uh, they're on their fourth draft of the of the screenplay, and like they're doing a screen test right now, and so that's all very exciting. But um, uh, but I don't know if I'll be able to go see it. <laughs> too much maybe I'll just go and close my eyes I don't know um, I'm sure it'll be awesome but like but that's um, uh, the thought is very stressful to me actually so anyway. mm. yeah. um, I have a question so yeah please this this one I was wondering about between everything that you've written is there a story that you feel uh, is sort of neglected like you you wish more people had read yes, this story. Yes, I will. And that's Iron Hearted Violet. It's my red-headed okay. stepchild. Yeah. Right. And part of it was, um, you know, I mean, it sort of is the classic story my editor left right before, um, right, uh -huh. right after my, um, uh, uh, right after it went into the art department. So there was, ju it just didn't have a champion. Yeah. And, um, and, um, uh, I, and, yeah, and Little Brown is, it's a wonderful publisher, but they just didn't know what to do with my kinds of books. Sure. Um, and, um, um, and so it really withered on the vine. Like, mm. um, I, um, I mean, it, it, and it, you know, was you know finalist for some awards and won an award and whatever. And and yet, like, I mean, nobody's ever heard of it. Like, its sales are terrible. Uh, finally, that was just actually just before I came here, I just found out that um, uh, there's a children's theater that has optioned it to um, uh, to develop as a as a children's play, oh, wow. which is very exciting for yeah. me. It's like, oh, people will love my violin. <laughs> And it's it's actually I think it might be my favorite of my of my four books as I heard of Violet. Um, I I um, I wrote it really specifically uh, to be able to be able to read out be read out loud in a, in a classroom. Like the chapters are nice and short. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, it's super nerdy. Like yeah. it's oh it's so nerdy. So um, <laughs> so that's that's also close to my heart too. So. Great. But anyway, I was just. 
given the sign that we're out of time. Oh. Thank you so much. Everybody Thanks join everyone. me. Thank you.